All right, next up, we are going to start talking about directional indicating instruments. So the most basic form that we have is going to be a magnetic compass. So this diagram you see in front of you is similar to what we would commonly call a whiskey compass, uh, partially because this entire cavity is filled with a thick, almost kerosene-like liquid that helps to damp the rotation of this card is what we call this indicating portion. Now each one of these hashes on the card is going to be five degrees and when the pilot looks at it it's lined up with what we call a lever line right here which is just a bar that sits right in front of the window where the uh, magnet card shows and that shows the actual heading and it's not that dissimilar from what you would see with a regular compass that you hold in your hand except it's made to function a little bit better in flight attitudes. So this pivot that you see right here, this allows the magnet to accommodate for increases in pitch and uh, decreases in pitch or banking. Uh, obviously, you can run into some issues if the aircraft is inverted, but uh, ultimately it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect. Uh, it's subject to a couple issues, uh, one of which is electromagnetic interference. So if we have anything near the compass that would produce a magnetic field like wires that go to a light, or even wires that go to the instrument lamp right here, they're going to produce a electromagnetic field, which is going to cause some deviation with our compass right here. And so there's a couple things we can do when we install any uh, wires that are going to be in the vicinity of a uh, magnetic compass like this, much like we would do with sensitive radio equipment, we can twist those pairs of wires to try to, try to cut down on the electromagnetic uh, interference. We also have these compensating screws down here. So when we calibrate this compass to a specific heading, we can use these compensating screws to try to get it closer to its actual heading that it should read. And part of this whole process is what we refer to as a compass swing. So a lot of airports you'll see have a compass rose laid out on the tarmac somewhere. And the idea is in order to get a accurate depiction of how this compass indicates when it's installed in the aircraft, we need to have it installed in the aircraft. So we can roll the aircraft out to a spot on the tarmac. We would park it right in the middle here and we can face it in different cardinal directions on the compass rows and see what the compass inside the aircraft reads and make adjustments as necessary. Now, when we take a look at that, right, this is what we would be looking at. We have our north-south adjustment on the left side and our east-west adjustment on the right side. And then you can see that lever line looking at our actual indication right there. All this information is going to go on to what we call a correction card. Now, a correction card is going to show the deviation from the true heading when we're in that position. So basically, we would steer the aircraft or put the aircraft facing the north angle or the north cardinal on our compass rows and we're going to read what the compass says. We'll try to adjust it to get it as close as possible, but it may not read exactly on. You'll also notice that you see a couple different indications, radio on, radio off. Because of electromagnetic interference, it could potentially change our reading on the compass, and so we need to account for that as well. So these numbers that you see here are the degrees of deviation from that heading or basically what the compass actually reads when it's pointing in that direction. So here, if we have a true heading of 030, then with the radio on, this is telling us that it reads 032. And that's basically getting it as close as we can. That deviation is allowed, but it's limited. We can only have 10 degrees of deviation on any particular uh, direction that the aircraft is facing. So we really do have to be cautious about this, but this is a normal procedure that we would do to be able to make that adjustment. So it, usually what would spawn this is if we have a change in equipment, right? If we install a new radio or we change equipment in the cockpit that could potentially affect the uh, operation of that magnetic compass, then we're going to re-swing with that new equipment to determine what the actual deviation is. Now that's different from variation. Variation is basically a term that just describes the fact that the magnetic north pole is not the same wherever you are on Earth. Uh, depending on how close you are to the pole, depending on where you are projected out on the Earth's surface, is going to be a little bit different. It's not the exact same as magnetic north as far as true north goes. So if you're looking at a compass, it may not actually be pointing at the north pole of the Earth. It will be in the vicinity, but not dead into the center of it. So that's variation that's different from deviation. Deviation is caused by the equipment and the installations inside the aircraft. 
Now, something that we have that's a step up from this is what we call a vertical card magnetic compass, or sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as an HSI, a horizontal situation indicator. Uh, it can be combined with other equipment like an ILS or a few others. We're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So this compass utilizes a gyroscope in order to maintain a heading. So ultimately we have a gyroscope inside this case that spins, 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 spins. And because of the way the inertia works, as the aircraft rotates, it's going to rotate around that gyroscope inside the case, basically. And so when we set this compass on the ground at a specific uh, direction, we can synchronize it to a heading. That gyroscope is gonna continue spinning and we'll keep it fairly accurate as the aircraft flies. Now, one issue that we do run into is as the aircraft flies, that gyro can process over time, which means it won't come back to the exact same spot every single time, especially if we go into some uh, higher attitude maneuvers. That can be a problem because we need our directional equipment to be accurate. Uh, in some cases, uh, some small aircraft, you may just readjust the compass every once in a while to account for that precession. Uh, in other cases, we have some ways to solve that. One of these is called a flux valve. Now, a flux valve is remotely located on the aircraft, so it's typically going to be out on like a wingtip, uh, anything that's going to be away from any sources of electromagnetic interference. And it looks a little bit crazy, but basically it's just a, a suspended disc that acts like a pendulum so that nothing influences the way that it points. And this is a magnetic sensitive device. So we have basically three different frames along with coils on each one of those frames. And it's excited by 400 hertz AC. So we're going to run AC current, which is going to swap direction back and forth, which is important for us because the thing that happens as we go to our peak of alternating current in one direction and our peak of alternating current in the other direction is we're gonna have a neutral point somewhere in between. So you can see this is where the flux valve is suspended from a U-joint. We have the exciter coils on the inside and the pickup coils on the outside. These exciter coils are where the AC flows through and these pickup coils are going to be sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. So the way that this works is depending on the direction the aircraft is facing. In this case, if the aircraft is facing north, we'll say, right? So we'll say that's north. For that moment of time when AC current is not flowing either direction, when we hit that neutral point, then it's going to be sensitive to the magnetic field from the planet. And so depending on the direction we go, the magnetic current is, or the magnetic field is going to induce current that flows in different ways through this flux valve. So basically when we're at neutral on our AC excitement, if we were facing north, then the way that the magnetic field flows is going to strike this top frame is going to pass through and evenly distribute on either side. As that magnetic field passes through, it's going to generate current in these pickup coils. Those, that current being generated in the pickup coils can be read by our compass in the main portion of the aircraft. And so again, if we were saying that this is due north, here we would have the aircraft facing to the east, and you can see the field is approaching from the same spot, but because the aircraft is rotated, the magnetic field is going to travel through the frame in a different way, and it's going to excite those coils in a different way, producing a different voltage. This works similar to the principle of a synchro system. So we're sending three phase AC over to the compass itself. And what this is gonna do is it's actually going to drive the gyro and correct for precession over time. I, we could really get a lot deeper into how this works, but just for the understanding of how the system fundamentally works, this is going to be a very sensitive piece of equipment that's located away from the main body of the aircraft and can pick up the Earth's magnetic field. It's going to send information back to our compass system inside the cockpit, whether that's a regular steam gauge, a glass front, a vertical card compass, or if it's part of a more complex electronic package or glass cockpit package. Either way, it's gonna send that current information back and it can drive the gyroscopes in such a way that we can account for the precession and the magnetic heading remains accurate. Now, the difference is if we were flying, say, way up at the North Pole, like uh, you're doing a, a transit from, say, Seattle to the UK, so you're flying way up over 
northern Canada, it's going to become less accurate because of the magnetic variation. So we actually have two modes that can be operated. We can either operate it in slave mode, which allows this uh, flux valve to be able to input information to the compass and correct, or it can operate in an open mode. So it's basically exclusively a gyro and we don't get thrown off by the magnetic variation that close to the pole. This is a diagram of what this system might look like. I'm just going to summarize this a little bit for you. So in this case, we have the slaved gyro for our compass, and we have the torque motor, which is being driven by the information being received from the flux valve and the flux valve synchro. So here's our flux valve out in the wing. This is the synchro that it drives. It's going to run current through a step-up transformer, basically. That's going to go through an amplifier, and it drives a motor, which in turn drives our attitude gyro to correct for precession. On the flip side, we have our synchro and the movable dial that's connected to the front of the compass. On the other hand, so we can change the position of this synchro by changing the position of the card inside the cockpit. That's the simplest way to describe what's going on here. When you actually look at the airplane, you'll see areas where the flux valve is installed. Usually you'll see a panel underneath the wing and it's marked as such because it's a very sensitive piece of equipment. Speaking of gyros, we're going to talk about gyroscopes real quick. Principle, relatively simple, probably covered this in basic physics, but if we have a weighted rotor, so for this, we would call it a gimbal with this arrangement. So if this rotor spins and spins and spins and spins because of the way that inertia works, if we move this frame around, this rotor is going to stay in fundamentally the same position so long as this gimbal allows it to rotate freely. Uh, now, if we only have, let's say, two fixed points right here and here, if we move it left to right, then it'll force the rotor to move. But if we move it back and forth this direction, then the rotor is going to stay in the same place. Then we can use this trick to be able to power a couple different instruments. So we're going to talk about those real quick. The first and most obvious is our attitude indicator or artificial horizon. You'll hear some people talk about this is powered by a 360 degree movement gyroscope. So we have a motor inside the instrument that turns that rotor. It can either be powered by vacuum power, so using suction from a vacuum pump, or it can be powered by an electric motor, either way. It's going to spin and spin and spin, and it allows that rotor to stay in the same place. So as the aircraft moves, that rotor or that gimbal is slaved to the card that we have in the front of the instrument. Depends from who made it? There's a couple different designs for which part moves, but it's all fundamentally the same. So as the aircraft banks, pitches up, whatever it is, that gyro stays in the same place and it gives us the deflection on our card so that we can see what attitude the aircraft is in. This is an example of one you'd see commonly installed in small aircraft all the way up to large aircraft as, say, a backup gyro system. Uh, a lot of aircraft now are incorporating glass cockpits, but you will still see traditional gauges like this used as a backup system in the event uh, that we have a, a failure of a glass cockpit system. But it, it's going to pull from the same information and work on the same principle. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here is we have an adjustment knob right here. And basically all this does is when the aircraft is level, it allows us to move this little indicator that represents the airplane up and down to match with the horizon when we are straight and level at, at, at uh, that correct attitude. We talked about our vertical card gyro heading indicator, our vertical card compass. It's going to work off the same uh, uh, component. Uh, I guess one thing to point out is so when we talk about our attitude indicator, it's going to detect movement about the longitudinal and about the lateral axes of the aircraft. So we're looking at pitch and roll. When we're looking at the vertical card heading indicator, this is only going to be detecting movement about the vertical axis of the aircraft. So we're only really looking at yaw to see the change in aircraft heading. Uh, again, we talk a little bit about precession. So over time, what can happen is as we rotate this weight, if we apply force to one side of the shaft, it can cause it to rotate in a different direction. So as we displace it, let's say up, it can force the gyroscope to actually rotate this direction. That's what we talk about with precession. And that's what we have that flux valve to help with with our gyro compass. Another uh, piece of equipment we have is our turn indicator, or sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as a slip slide indicator. So what we have 
this is used a lot with instrument flying, we have an indicated turn. So in this case, we have a four minute turn and the four minute turn is indicated by these two chevrons right here. You'll hear people refer to them as dog houses sometimes in the aviation lingo. What happens is we have another gyroscope inside this piece of equipment and it's going to detect movement about the vertical axis and about the longitudinal axis. So we're looking at yaw and bank. As the aircraft banks, this needle is going to deflect. So if this needle points at the left doghouse, then we will make a complete 360 degree turn in four minutes. That's what it means by a four minute turn. It gets used commonly with instrument flight. If an aircraft is placed into a hold, a lot of times they'll be instructed to, to make a, a specific kind of turn and execute a 360 for spacing with other aircraft. Obviously, if you can't see where you're going, you have to be in a relatively safe area, so an aircraft can be instructed to do that. This ball right here is not synced to a gyro. It's actually a little bit more like a bubble level, but this ball will move back and forth. And what that tells us is whether or not the turn is coordinated. So as an aircraft banks, it has a tendency for the tail to skid out in the opposite direction of the bank. It kind of drifts a little bit. That can be counteracted by applying rudder in the direction of the turn. So if we have a left turn, a left bank, then we can apply a little bit of left rudder and that'll keep the tail in line with the aircraft. It makes for a more efficient turn and tends to uh, help the aircraft to fly better. And so this ball will indicate whether or not we are making a coordinated turn. So in this case, if we have the four minute turn, we're aligned with one doghouse, and in order for that to actually be true and not have the aircraft skidding all over the sky, that ball must mean it remain centered within this cage. If both those are true, then the aircraft will turn 360 degrees in four minutes. That's what we get from this instrument. All right, uh, talking a little bit more about this uh, rate gyro in here. So, the thing with a turn indicator is it's not a free spinning gyro entirely. What we have is it's a rate gyro. So we're really talking about rate of turn. Uh, again, if we just if it was just a matter of having a uh, indication of how far the aircraft was banked, then we could use our attitude indicator for that. But in this case, it's all about turn rate. And part of what's going to factor into that is the G-loading of the aircraft. And so what we have here is this calibrated spring which is going to act against our plane of rotation, talking about the aircraft. And so as the aircraft rotates, that spring will have a little bit of tension increased on it, and that's going to limit the amount that the gyro can move, which gives us the coordinated aspect of that indicator's uh, display. This, uh, I probably shouldn't use these terms uh, uh, interchangeably, uh, but this is another variation on that we call a turn coordinator. As I mentioned before, the whole point is that it coordinates our turn. So we have the same arrangement, a ball that's centered in the cage, and then instead of the dog houses that we saw up where the chevron points, we have a depiction of the aircraft, and then we have a depiction of the bank angle or the, the turn rate. So as the aircraft banks, this little card with the airplane will start to dip and it will line up the wingtip with one of these chevrons. Again, the same concept. We keep that chevron aligned with the wingtip. We keep the ball centered and the aircraft will make a two minute, 360 degree turn. One thing about this particular axis is the turn coordinator is going to be tilted at 30 degrees. We're seeing a little bit more than we would with the other version. We don't have the spring. Instead, we're doing this by running a regular gyro and it's tilted at 30 degrees so it can detect both roll and yaw. Remember, when we talked about the previous version, we were primarily just looking at yaw, but this is also going to be able to sense roll with the same device. So if that, you can kind of picture how that works. Again, this isn't something that will tear apart, but the operating concept is, is useful to know so we can get this sorted out.